I guess if I had to divide the food, I'd divide it by the three main cultures that we dealt with, right? The, the white people, the Maori people, and the islanders. Um, white people, probably the biggest food would be, that you'd want to know is fish and chips, right? And by chips, I don't mean like potato chips. I mean basically French fries, but kind of thick French fries, right? And there's kind of deep fried battered fish. And you go to your local fish and chip shop and you order that and they'll you know, take, give you a couple battered fish and your scoop of chips and salt it up and then they'll wrap it up in some paper and then they'll wrap that up in some newspaper. And then you can take that, eat it. Um, kind of, I always always kind of like glance at the news while I was munching on my fish and chips. Um, you'll learn to like that. You're probably gonna have a lot of that. Um, apart from that, the white people food in New Zealand is more or less what you'd expect from a kind of American or English background. It's pretty typical. Um, the national dessert is the pavlova, which is kind of this interesting flaky dessert pastry, but it's not super amazing and there's nothing you're missing if you don't have lots of them. Ice cream is better. <laughs> Moving on to the next group, I'd say the Maoris. They're probably their best known dish is a boil up, which is they take, um, it's, it's what it sounds like. You just take whatever you have lying around and boil it up. Usually that's going to involve pork bones, watercress, and maybe a couple of other things. And it's kind of like this stew. It's pretty good if you get a good one. I know a couple of people who have had, a couple of missionaries who had bad experiences with a boil up gone bad and uh, had a, a little intestinal distress the next day, but that's not really anything I'd worry about. And then the last big group is the islanders, right? The Tongan Samoans. And the main thing to note with them is not so much what you'll be eating, but how much you'll be eating, because you'll be eating a lot. Uh, in my experience, the, especially the members, the Tongan and Samoan members, the more you eat, or the more the missionaries eat, the more the island members respect them. Because, you know, I don't know, eating is just something you're meant to do. It's just kind of cultural, right? So you're going to take this big heaping plate and you're going to eat all of it and you're going to be stuffed. And then the member is going to say, Elder, don't be shy, have some more food. And then you're going to have some more food because you can't just say no. Um, so I've been in a lot of situations where I was at like, a big islander wedding feast and had so much that I didn't need to eat for like the next day or two. Um, I really miss those times when you get such a meal you really gotta appreciate it you'll you'll love it. Apart from that the missionaries favorite food definitely KFC. Um, it's also it's because it's also the islanders favorite food right they're thinking of changing the name to PFC Polynesian first choice instead of Kentucky Fried Chicken. Um, yeah good memories of that place. Every missionary that I've ever met in my whole life that's ridden a bike has had their great mission to bike crash, right? Every missionary has that one story where they are going a million miles an hour downhill and then they trip on a small rock and they fly over the handlebars spectacularly and then they land on their feet and they stick the landing and the judges give them a 10 out of 10 and the bike is just like a smoldering heap on the ground, like totally destroyed. Uh, and I kind of had one like that. Uh, the bike was okay, mostly. Well, it was a pretty crap bike after that, but, but it still worked. I still had to use it anyway. <laughs> um, and I didn't get broken, but yeah, it was, it was a pretty ex ex exciting crash based on eyewitness testimony. So uh, my companion at the time, he was like uh, like amateur bike racer in Germany. <laughs> and he was just like super pro at bikes. So he could bike a million miles faster than I could. He was like, so he, and we were going down this, in, it was in Wellington. There was basically this whole suburb was like a giant hill and we had been seeing someone at the top of the hill and now we had to go back down to the bottom to get to where we lived. Um, so he was zipping down at a million miles an hour. So he was a couple hundred yards ahead of me. We could still see each other, but he was going fast. And then in between him and me, some car pulled out from another street and it was going, but they were kind of going slow and I was going fast, right? And so I had, was annoyed, so I kind of had to slow down a little bit, but then they sped up. And so I'm like, okay, I can let myself go faster again. And then in the middle of the road, like out of nowhere, they just slam on the brakes. And I'll never understand why. Um, there was no one around. There was no point to it. But so then I have to slam on the brakes. And now the thing that I didn't tell you was that this downhill road had just been resurfaced, but or was just being resurfaced, but they hadn't sealed it yet. So it was basically a bunch of loose gravel. <laughs> and going fast downhill, slamming on the brakes on a bunch of loose gravel. It turns out it's a recipe for disaster because my as I was breaking, I felt my back tire just skidding like it was swerving out from under me and I just knew, oh, I'm going to crash. I'm going to die. Uh, and the best part was I had a cast on my left arm at the time, too. Or no, maybe I had just gotten the cast off because I had broken my little finger. 
Um, that's a story too. They put like they put me in a cast for just breaking my little finger. Can you believe that? New Zealand medicine people. But yeah, so as of my back tire was sliding, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna fall. I'm gonna die. I'm gonna fall on my left side and break my hand again. And I'm gonna get another cast. And I just got out of the last one. And I was just thinking all this. And then, because um, the way I was falling, I was just gonna fall like sideways on my bike, just like on my left side, and then skid for several meters and get wrecked. But somehow, by some miraculous means that I still don't understand, my leg, my right leg must have like swung over the handlebars and I just kind of like flew off and landed on my butt on the sidewalk and just skid for like a couple feet. My pants were destroyed. Um, underwear were fine though. <laughs> and, and the bike was like pretty messed up. But yeah, I was like, I still don't know how my leg swung like that because legs don't move like that naturally. Um, so that's probably like angels or something if you want to call it that. But yeah, that, that's, that was a funny one. It was funny in retrospect. My companion sure got a kick out of seeing the hole in my pants as we were biking home when he finally came back for me. Because <laughs> he was—he he didn't see any of this happen because he was too far ahead. I went through quite a few extremes of weather. Probably the most is just the unending, eternal, persistent, unchanging rain in the winter. Um, <laughs> there was one instance when I was in Greymouth in the South Island, and Greymouth is kind of, the town kind of has two halves, um, separated by the river, and it's not like a, such a big river. And we were on one side, and my companion and I were just getting drenched. The rain was coming straight down, no wind, and there was nothing, we were wearing everything we had, getting super wet, and it was about five o'clock in the evening, and we later found out the next day that on the other side of the river, there was... And on our side of the river, there was no wind, right? Just pure rain. On the other side of the river, there was a tornado at the time. Uh, we didn't find that out till we went to church the next day and heard the sister and during fast and testimony meeting bear testimony about how her children were out earlier delivering their papers um, for their paper route. And then they came in just before and then the tornado struck um, and tore down some power lines and caused lots of damage right on the very street where they were delivering papers. Um, but I didn't actually see any of that or know it happened until later, so that's probably the most extreme weather I ever saw. New Zealand doesn't have any dangerous animals or really any animals that are bad. All of those live in Australia, but New Zealand is totally immune from all of them. Um, insects, you get sand flies, which are just kind of like gnat or mosquitoes. They can bite you if you get, um, especially on the South Island in like the more coastal areas, but they're not such a huge deal in my experience. I know a lot of missionaries got like bed bugs, but you just buy one of the bed bug bombs and those will go away. And yeah, so insects wasn't too bad. And then the rest of the animal life, there's a lot of flightless birds in New Zealand um, that are, most of them are endangered because it turns out if you're a flightless bird, um, you can't run away or escape from people's cats very well. Uh, or the possums. Possums in New Zealand are not the same thing as possums in the Northern Hemisphere. Possums in the Northern Hemisphere are just like, they don't do anything, they just play dead, right? But possums in the Southern Hemisphere are a completely different animal. They just happen to have the same name. They're kind of like an angry cat that lives in trees and eats flightless birds. Um, so possum hunting is a very exciting game for people who live in the more rural areas especially. And possum fur, like when they put it into gloves or things, is very soft actually. One of them is called um, Pawa, which is just the Maori word for like abalone. And it's kind of a pretty strong seafood taste. If you don't like seafood, you should probably actually get, um, a, get an acquire a taste for it before you go, because you'll, you'll eat quite a lot of it, especially with the fish and chips, right? Um, so creamed Pawa was quite interesting. I enjoyed it though, because I'm, I'm a seafood lover myself. And then they have Kenna, which is like sea urchin eggs or something. Um, I don't think I ever actually had Kenna, but, but by all accounts, that's really interesting. And then they have this one thing in South, the South Island where I served called white bait, which is like each one is a tiny fish like this big, but you catch a billion of them and then you fry them up into these fritters and they're totally tasteless. They don't taste like anything, but they're just interesting. First of all, I'll probably give you the, the Mormon Maori origin story, backstory, history, whatever. So back in the day, if you turn to Alma chapter 63, you got Hagoth and he builds a couple of boats and sails west and nobody ever hears about him again. Um, well, he hits some land that the Maori legends call Hawaii. Um, sounds like Hawaii to me. I, I don't know about you, but that's just me. Um, and then from then, there the ancestors of the Maori come from Hawaii to Aotearoa, which is the Maori name for New Zealand. 
uh, these seven waka, and a waka is like an outrigger canoe um, for crossing ocean especially. So these seven ancestral waka all come to New Zealand and all the, oh and that's another thing, it's um, whakapapa is the Maori word for genealogy and it's actually like a big thing in Maori tradition because properly every Maori should be able to trace their, their lineage back from wherever they are, back to their parents, their um, their hapu, which is like their sub-tribe, their iwi, which is their tribe, and get their lineage traced back all the way to when their ancestors came on these boats to New Zealand, on these waka. So you, you might see, I've seen a lot of members on their wall, they have their like, their genealogy all traced out, you know, really beautifully, and then it'll trace back to say, oh, you know, I came from Takitimu waka, or I came from Tainui, or whatever. It's really neat seeing how all that works out. The Maori culture is really neat. Um, oh, I'll tell you about the marae, because um, I probably for a good three, four months didn't understand what a marae is. It's kind of, in Maori culture, there's a building called the marae, and it's really kind of the Maori town hall, common house, um, church, everything combined. It's like their community center. And you'll always recognize them because they're always painted red in the front and so they got this big all this they'll have all this carving um, this red post you'll you'll know them when you see them i saw one that was green but um that was because it was from the land of the green stone but uh, they're, they're always red the marae is really important to maori life like i was saying it's got the uh, so back in the day before a lot of church buildings were built in new zealand that's where they'd have church whenever uh, there's a maori funeral that's where the maori funeral is at um the maori funeral is called a tangi Actually, tangihana means like crying or tears, and so yeah, the marae is um, it's a big it's a big thing in Maori communal life, and since a lot of the members that you'll meet are Maori, um, you'll you'll be invited onto the marae a couple times. You're supposed to take off your shoes when you go in. You don't just go into the marae; you have to get invited on, and so there's a couple like little things like that. But it's pretty straightforward. There's not much to it really. Going further into Maori culture. The Maori language, compared to other like Polynesian languages, like or especially like Hawaiian, um, or even other indigenous languages in like North America, they are kind of dying out, and like not many native Hawaiians or speak Hawaiian anymore or have any idea of it. But Maori is actually held up pretty well. Uh, the government's done a lot to that effect, and trying to you know fund Maori programs. Uh, so a lot of young children are put into, they call it the. Um, uh, the Kohanga, Kohanga Reo, um, which is, Kohanga is like, it's like a preschool, and Reo is just language, so that's where they only speak to the kids in Te Reo Maori, the Maori language, uh, so the kids can learn a little bit of the language and grow up kind of, you know, bilingual with their Maori background and also speaking English, of course, because everybody speaks English. And that's really neat. Um, learning a bit of Maori is, it's a good, it's a good pursuit, it's nice to know, because uh, a lot of things are still, like, published in two languages. Not that there's really anyone anymore who only speaks Maori, there's not, but it is definitely good to pick up, and it helps, just helps you like be more connected with the culture, be more familiar with it. And it's a neat language too. It's like, what, I don't know, I tried to pick up a bit of the grammar once. I went to a couple of weeks of Maori class in one of my areas, and it's, it's, it's good, I liked it. It was really worth it. So the North Island is more populated, more cities, um, the church is bigger, all of those things. It's also warmer because it's further north. It's got, yeah, definitely better weather. The South Island gets really cold in the deep south, bottom of the South Island. It does snow in the winter. Um, snow in general you don't really get in New Zealand though. South Island is also much wetter. Not that the North Island isn't also wet because it is. Oddly enough, with how much it rains, you never really get thunder and lightning. It's just kind of constant drizzle. Um, apart from that, differences between the two. Yeah, South Island really rural. South Island has just farming is most of it. Not that the North Island doesn't have lots of farming too, because it does. That's one of New Zealand's biggest industries, right, is either sheep or cattle. I think the big thing that a lot of missionaries notice is just the land is different in the two. The North Island is kind of more dry, rolling hills, and the South Island is really, it's got the Southern Alps, these really, this really big mountain range, lots of so snowy mountains all over the place, kind of more wild, untamed is the South Island, so. I guess just looking at it demographically, the North Island has almost all of the Maori people in New Zealand, and it also has almost all of the Pacific Islanders, which, although there's not so many in the Wellington Mission itself, like population-wise, almost all the Pacific Islanders in New Zealand are in Auckland, but 
the Tongans and Samoans that we do have in the Wellington mission, you'll meet very quickly because almost you no, know, just the Tongans and Samoans have such huge membership in the church that you'll meet a lot of Tongan and Samoan members. And so almost all the Maori and Tongans and Samoans are in the North Island. The South Island is much more white, it's much more Pakia or Palangi, if you want to speak a little Tongan. And so you'll find that just that kind of demographic difference between the two. The South Island, the land is much more beautiful, I would say. Um, North Island, places that a missionary might want to go. You probably want to go to, if you ever serve in the Hawks Bay Zone, you probably want to go up to Tsemata Peak. If you go at night, even better. Um, the Danny Verk, my first area, has the original place where Matthew Kelly translated the Book of Mormon into Maori that a member maintains, and a little old chapel there that it's locked now, the front door, but if you can still go in this door in the back and sneak in, um, it didn't used to be locked the front, but you can still get in. And that's cool to see as well, this old chapel back from probably around the turn of the last century. Well, apart from that, just all the natural wonders and beauty and everything. You know, go see the Alps, go see the um, Pancake Rocks if you ever serve on the West Coast. If you get lucky enough to serve in Queenstown, which is like the adventure capital of the world, um, in the deep south of New Zealand, then you get to see like everything. It's super cool. I always wanted to go there, but I never got transferred. <laughs> if you get like one of the little maps that you'll be using to find your way around, they have all the little Lord of the Rings sites marked out. So it's like, oh, this scene was shot here, this scene was shot here, this scene was shot here. If you want to beforehand, you can buy one of those little guidebooks and flip through that and see all the different Lord of the Rings sites and where they were all shot. A lot of them were shot in the Wellington mission because we have the coolest natural landscapes and beauty and all that. So my friends in New Zealand, kia ora tato tabarikima. That's something like shout out to all the boys, but not really, but anyway. Um, I want you to know that I still love you, I still care about you, and I still think about you. I see you on Facebook all the time now. And I'm so happy to have the opportunity to have lived with you, served with you, eaten with you, and to really got to know you. Because I do love you, my New Zealand brothers and sisters. And I think I've been blessed, probably above a lot of people. I've been super blessed to have the chance to come and live and serve and work in Aotearoa for the two years of my life. And the things that I learned and the experiences that I gained in those two years, um, I think I probably lived more in those two years than I would have lived in 10 or 20 years otherwise. Just so much happened, so much that I saw, and so many places I went, people I talked to, things I did. And I'll be really eternally indebted and forever grateful for being able to come and live in your beautiful country and with you beautiful people.